Hello, this is a presentation of a paper at the 2021 Virtual Conference of Math Psych and ICCM. I'm Tim Halverson. My co-authors are Chris Myers, Jeff Gearhart, Matthew Lenakis, and Glenn Kunzman. The paper title is Physiocognitive Modeling, Explaining the Effects of Caffeine on Fatigue. Human cognition is constantly affected and constrained by the environment, and decades of research in mathematical and computational modeling has shown how our, how our interaction with the environment constrains and facilitates cognition and action. But until relatively recently, physiological stressors have been largely ignored in formal models of cognition. Why is it important to account for the ways in which deliberate or accidental exposure to chemicals can affect cognition? It is important for at least two reasons. First, most people are regularly exposed to many compounds that can affect their cognition, such as cleaners and caffeine. Second, in safety-critical situations, such as piloting and scuba diving, the accidental exposure or restriction of the wrong compounds, like oxygen, can have dramatic effects. To understand the effects of these stressors on behavior, we not only need to understand the effects of those compounds on our physiology, but also how those physiological changes affect cognition. This work integrates computational models of physiology and cognition to better understand the relationship between these processes and to allow the prediction of performance decrements or enhancements before they happen. The physiological models used in this research are called PBPK, or Physiologically Based Pharmacokinetic Models. They're also known as PBTK, Physiologically Based Toxicokinetic Models. PBPK models account for the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of synthetic or natural chemical substances in human and other animals. The diagram shown here gives examples of organs or other tissue that are represented in the architecture. Importantly, these models can predict the concentration of target compounds in the brain across time. The cognitive models we use are built in the ACTAR cognitive architecture. ACTAR represents mechanisms of the mind that are stable across tasks. Strategies, encoded in production rules, coordinate the recruiting of the, those mechanisms for tasks. The integration of these two modeling formalisms is represented in the diagram here. This example is taken from the work by Fisher et al. cited at the bottom. A similar integration is used in research we're presenting here. First, we present the compound of interest to the PBPK model in accordance with the protocol, timing, and dose of exposures for which we are making predictions. This produces a prediction of compound concentration over time. These predictions are used to scale parameters in ACTAR. And finally, ACTAR makes predictions of performance where the cognitive processes are affected by the underlying physiology. The compound of interest in this research is caffeine. Caffeine acts as an adenosine receptor antagonist. Adenosine facilitates sleep by slowing neural activity. Since caffeine reduces this slowing, the neural circuits where those adenosine receptors are concentrated remain more active in the presence of caffeine and its metabolites. While adenosine receptors are found in many regions, the majority of the research we reviewed concludes that the A2A receptors are a primary mechanism through which caffeine affects cognition. And A2A receptors are most highly concentrated in the basal ganglia, most notably in the striata palatal and striata nigral pathways. While caffeine does affect more physiological mechanisms, with some examples shown in the graph on the right, we focus on the A2A receptor for two reasons. First, we want to focus on one mechanism at a time to see how much explanatory power that can have. Second, adenosine seems to be most active at the concentration used in the human data we predicted. Based on that literature, this graphic shows the pieces put together in this research. In both the physiological and cognitive models, there are many parameters that could interact to produce behavior. The PBPK model predicts caffeine concentrations in all tissues included in the model. In this work, we explored the use of plasma concentrations, which is a standard metric used in PBPK modeling. We also explored concentrations in the brain tissue, as that is our target organ, so to speak. Determining which parameters in ACTAR to map these concentrations to was a primary goal of this research. We started by focusing on the modules recruited by the task. The task model is a psychomotor vigilance task, or PVT. Previous research has successfully explained a lot of data in this task with ACTAR models. In addition, 
We focused on parameters in the ACTAR sleep module as the data we modeled was collected from fatigued individuals. As the title of this paper states, this work is looking to explain the effects of caffeine on fatigued people. We started by modeling data of humans performing the PVT from McIntyre et al. cited at the bottom of this slide. In their experiment, they kept their participants awake for 30 hours. After 21 hours, some participants were given 200 milligrams of caffeine by gum. Others were given a placebo. There was a third condition in which participants received transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS, and a placebo gum. We don't model this data set in this work for two reasons. First, simply put, it's beyond the scope of this work. Second, less is known about the physiological effects of TDCS than of caffeine. The data from that study is summarized in the graph on the left. The three metrics shown, mean response time, lapses, and false starts, are commonly used in, with the PVT to assess alertness. Lapses are responses 500 milliseconds after stimulus onset or later. False starts are responses 150 milliseconds after stimulus onset or earlier, including responses during the interstimulus interval. The results shown in gray are those of fatigue participants. This data shows trends usually observed as people become fatigued, that is, response times slow and become increasingly skewed to the right, and both lapses and false starts increase substantially. People who are caffeinated, shown in black, tended to have faster responses and fewer lapses. However, importantly, false starts did not appear to be affected by 200 milligrams of caffeine. Previous research by Glenn Gunzelman and others have shown that the effects of fatigue on performance can be explained as microlapses, which are brief interruptions or disruptions to procedural processes. These microlapses are more likely to occur as alertness levels decrease, as predicted by a biomathematical model of fatigue. These microlapses make it less likely that productions will match, and thus more likely that microlapses will occur in the future. Decreased alertness also makes it more likely that goal-irrelevant productions will fire when the model is fatigued. Three parameters that affect these outcomes in the sleep module within ACTAR will be discussed in this talk. They are listed on this slide, along with the equations affected in ACTAR, and each will be explained in turn. Before integrating the PBPK models into ACTAR, we explored those three parameters and others to see how they may or may not predict the observed performance improvements caused by caffeine. Action selection noise, while not part of the fatigue module, affects the likelihood of goal-relevant productions matching instead of goal-irrelevant productions matching. In the case of the PVT model, the relevant goal is responding when the stimulus is present. The irrelevant goal is responding at any time. Action selection is affected by ACTAR's partial matching mechanism. In the mathematical underpinnings of the fatigue module, a reduction in noise has the benefit of mitigating reductions in alertness without directly negating decreases in alertness. However, we could not find a change to the noise parameter that could account for all three trends seen in the data. One value of noise might fit one metric better than another, but no one value did well at predicting all three metrics. The results shown here had the best fit to the mean response time while also trying to minimize the error of the other metrics. Surprisingly, this resulted from an increase in noise, counter to our hypothesis. In general, noise had very little differentiating effect on lapses and a substantial effect on response times and false starts. And this is not good, so we kept exploring. UTBMC affects the production thresholds. This is a fatigue compensation mechanism in the fatigue module that makes it less likely that a microlapse will happen, although more likely that a goal irrelevant production will be selected. The use of this parameter in the fatigue module characterizes caffeine as an indirect counter to fatigue. That is, an increase in UTBMC will result in a lower threshold and thus more compensation, but no less fatigue. The results for this parameter is much more promising. Unlike noise, varying UTBMC predicts a differentiation in lapses as seen in the human data. However, this model variation predicts a slight increase in false starts that was not seen in the human data. So, we kept exploring. FPBMC affects the production utilities. 
A reduction in FPBMC decreases the detrimental effect of fatigue on production utility by directly undoing the decrease in production utility that results from fatigue. This characterizes caffeine as more directly undoing the effects of fatigue. The results for this parameter are even more promising than for UTBMC. While most fits are similar to UTBMC, moderate changes to FPBMC predict no change in false starts, which is more in line with the observed data. Now that we have a good candidate mechanism to explain the effects of caffeine, FPBMC, can we do even better by integrating PBPK predictions? Our initial hypothesis was yes, that integrating physiological and cognitive models would facilitate better predictions of human behavior. As we see on this graph, the fits did improve. While most of the changes are not dramatic, the improvements are important. The variance in the PBPK model's predictions help the predicted performance values to more closely approximate those in the human data. Even more important is that the PBPK model can provide caffeine concentration predictions that vary not only with time, but with different caffeine dose regimens. As you may recall from earlier, PBPK models predict concentrations in a wide variety of organs and other tissues, and that we explored the use of plasma concentrations and brain tissue in this modeling. While the differences were minor, it is worth noting, and it is comforting, that the concentrations in the brain tissue provided better predictions of human performance than the more widely used plasma concentrations. In conclusion, the major findings of this work are, first, the caffeine's effect at the synaptic level can inform modifications to cognitive architectures to account for their effects. This isn't surprising. Others like Terry Stewart and Andrea Stoko have been showing similar things for years. However, it's good to see that such data can also inform modeling cognitive moderators, like caffeine, and the integration of established models of physiology and cognition. Second, the modeling supports findings that ca caffeine effectively reverses the effects of fatigue. Other research has come to similar conclusions, such as the Penetar et al. work cited here using sleep onset and questionnaire results. Finally, we found that including physiologically valid models of caffeine kinematics can improve cognitive model predictions. That said, there is clearly more work to do. Additional data sets are needed for validation of the proposed mechanism. We're looking at that now, and things look very promising. Further, we've only considered a straightforward task that is largely procedural. Mapping caffeine concentrations to the same parameter for tasks that recruit other cognitive processes may not help. In addition, we know that there are many neural and other physiological factors we haven't incorporated. We don't know if our solution will scale to caffeine doses that result in a performance decrement. We also haven't accounted for individuals' varying sensitivity to caffeine. Still, this is a really good start and we're currently addressing some of those issues and hope to report back in the near future. Thank you, and we look forward to your questions at our Q&A session on July 7th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time.